Um, so I now look to Dr. Gideon Rose to close the case for the proposition. Mr. President, let me put this up here. <clears throat> Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, my notes are in order here. The proposition before this House this evening is whether it fears the decline of the United States as the global superpower. Given the manifold progress for humanity that has occurred during the period of American primacy, one would think this would not be all that difficult to question. But I could imagine two plausible counter-arguments in the opposition. Not that we've heard them, but I could imagine it. <laughs> one could argue that the progress has occurred, but it somehow was not connected to American primacy and therefore doesn't depend on it, and therefore if American primacy falls away, uh, the benefits would still remain and they'll all be fine. Uh, that's a plausible argument. Uh, one could also take the opposite view, which is that it doesn't matter if American primacy declines, because it has already achieved its purpose. It has managed to create a self-sustaining, rules-based international system with grounding from other major powers and institutionalization in a variety of ways that can survive on its own. And so like the tannins in a great bottle of claret that you have in the rooms after here, the United States can fade away, leaving behind the matured, healthy, uh, uh, liberal order uh, that uh, you see already, or we thought we had seen in some parts of Western Europe um, and uh, some places uh, more generally. It seems to me that um, both of these counter arguments are seriously flawed, and I'm going to try to explain why, and to therefore argue that the obvious answer, yes, we should fear the decline of American primacy for all the things that it uh, may lead to, uh, is in fact the correct one. Um, so to look at this picture in a little bit better light, I think it's helpful to zoom out. So let's go back about 40 years. What did the world look like in the 1970s? The United States and its allies, sort of like then as now, were sort of rich but disordered and stagnant. Okay? Uh, the Soviet Union had achieved military parity with the United States and it kept on going and was threatening to try to uh, impose its hegemony not just over uh, recalcitrant states, uh, states in Eastern Europe, but uh, in Africa uh, and elsewhere in the developing world. Uh, uh, China was convulsed by internal turmoil and desperate poverty. India was poorer than China. Brazil was ruled by a military junta and had an economy barely larger than India's. South Africa was divided into homelands under a regime of institutionalized racism. We all know that world, we lived it. it. Wasn't that long ago. Four decades later, the Soviet Union is dissolved. Its successor states have embraced capitalism and private property. China is still politically communist, but it chose markets over planning and has grown to have the world's second largest economy. Once destitute India now has the sixth largest economy. Brazil became a democracy, experienced an economic growth spurt, and now has the eighth largest economy. South Africa overturned apartheid and became a multiracial democracy. All of these countries still have problems. There's lots of terrible things going on around the world, and yet. But that's a pretty darn good track record. And as the Marxist used to say, it is no accident the direction in which those changes occurred. Those changes were the deliberate product of a liberal order that American and other Western policymakers put in place in the wake of the crises of the first half of the 20th century, specifically to prevent a recurrence of the age-old problems of multipolarity, which were a continuation of war, a continuation of economic crisis and a depression, and beggar thy neighbor self-help policies from people too stupid or uneducated or ignorant to understand the notion of a positive sum game. Unfortunately, one of those people happens to be the President of the United States right now, which is a topic we'll get to later. But liberalism, but liberalism in politics and economics, in the United States as in the United Kingdom, great liberal powers, is based on the understanding 
that economics and politics can be a positive sum game, that individuals in free association with each other within a structure of ordered liberty can communicate, can build systems, can overcome the problems of anarchy both at the domestic level and at, to some extent, in partial ways, the international level as well. Looking back on the track record of the first half of the 20th century, Western policymakers said, we just can't do this again. The next time, there won't be any next time. Right? To quote Eminem, next time, there won't be a next time. So the United States didn't, by the way, we didn't just come in to save uh, the Brits twice. We did it with Wilhelm in Germany, too. So it's been a long century of that. So we didn't just come in late in World War I. We didn't just come in a little less late in World War II. This time, we stayed and helped prevent World War III. And then when the long twilight struggle finally ended, when the Soviet Union collapsed in its own morass, um, we helped others expand and come in as well. And we created a system in which those powers could rise, in which people of all races, creeds, colors, of all regions had the opportunity to demonstrate their human potential and fulfill it in ways they had never before imagined. The honorable member from Maudlin had a good line. Um, uh, hegemony means intervention. I believe that was a, a line. You know, Grima Wormtongue with a good accent is still Grima Wormtongue. <laughs> intervention, American intervention was not the product of hegemony, and if it was, it was only the product of capacity. Because let's go through some of those American interventions. The intervention in Korea was a counter-intervention to force back a communist invasion in brute force across the 38th parallel designed to turn one police state into a much larger police state. Yeah, yeah. The United States intervention in Korea on behalf of the United Nations was in support of democracy and freedom and the Republic of Korea today and the line drawn in the sky in the night between North and South Korea is a testimony to what being inside the American hegemony and inside the American imperium can be. It's a chance to grow, a chance to... The United States didn't have regime change after the Korean War. We partnered with an authoritarian, local bad guy who was not particularly attractive. But because we allowed Korea to grow, because we allowed Korea to embrace the international system, because we protected it, the natural processes of modernization and evolution occurred inside Korea. The economy grew. The society developed. The political system liberalized. And just like all those theorists said, South Korea now is a member of the OECD and has managed to transform itself from a nation of poor rice paddies into a major industrialized democratic power. That is what being inside the American primacy sphere can mean if you use it properly. And North Korea on the other side of the 38th parallel is what being outside the American sphere means. The fact is that the progress the world has made over the last few generations is a consequence of American primacy, not a historical accident. A different non-liberal hegemon would have made different choices and the world would have looked very, very different. That non-liberal hegemon who could potentially follow the United States would make different choices. You're already seeing that in different parts of the world in which China is exercising its sway. The bargains are different, the results are different, and the loss of human potential is significant. So how about the other argument? Okay, what about the notion that U.S. primacy is already done because the liberal order, we can, we can be comfortable with it going away because everything is okay. We don't need the U.S. anymore. Well, what I would say is take a look at the last 18 months. You want to see what a post-American world would look like? You're getting a preview, okay? <laughs> You're getting a preview. So, you know, just the Anglosphere, in some act of amazing historical self-immolation, has taken itself out of global politics for the nonce and uh, essentially decided to let things play out on their own and experiment, as if to give us a sense of what life might be like once the United States is no longer playing a significant dominant leadership role. And if you like what you see, get more of it. Um, I don't particularly like it. But what about Trump? I can hear people saying. Well, at this point, I'm mortified to say I have to concede, as has become a phrase this month, 
that this is indeed America, right? Trump is indeed America. But so is the resistance to Trump. And so are the institutional structures that will channel and contain him and sustain the beast. This is not a King Kong movie in which the beast will take care of the cage and run on a rampage. This is like an old Samsonite commercial in which the beast is locked inside the cage with the suitcase and bounces up and down at the end, it still is all fine, okay? The opposition to Trumpism is American, and as John Meacham has argued, we've been through this before, we've fought these battles before, previous generations. I mean, in some ways it's embarrassing to me to see the lack of self-confidence in Western institutions that we're seeing today. Our great-grandparents defeated Wilhelmine, Germany, and the Kaiser's forces, and <clears throat> other imperial nations. Our grandparents defeated the fascists. Our grandparents and parents defeated the communists. All we have to do is not screw it up and keep things going a few more decades to get the last major power centers of the world on the escalator of growth. The fact is, right now, the United States is drunk but its opponents, its alternatives, are ugly, very ugly. And in the morning after Trump, the United States will be sober. And you should fear it if we're not powerful then. Yeah.